Hello and welcome to another top five video. That's right, we're keeping the trend alive. Three top five videos in three days. And today we're looking at the Rebel Alliance, specifically the five most powerful and most deadly ships used by the Rebel Alliance during the Galactic Civil War. And we're gonna draw from Legends and Canon for this list. We've only got a couple of rules today and the first is a pretty common one. No ships primarily used by other factions. We're looking at really unique Alliance ships. So for example, the Rebels used Bulwark and Droid Control ships, but they were also used by the Separatists and primarily used by the Separatists, so we're not gonna count those. No Republic ships, and no ships that were used by most factions. So for example, the Dreadnought Heavy Cruiser. My second rule is also a very common one, and it's just that we're gonna group any similar ships together. So for example, there were various MC-80 types. We're gonna count them all as one. And doing this video really opened my eyes to how the Rebel Alliance operated. I always assumed that pretty much everything they had other than the Mon Cal ships were hand-me-down or really old, but it turns out that they actually have some state-of-the-art vessels. However, as we'll see, they kind of like to go with many small craft. Compared to the Empire, who would have a few large Star Destroyers, the Rebel Alliance would use a mixture of smaller ships. So let's get right into the list with number five, the MC-30C Mon Calamari Frigate. And I mean, the fact that we're starting with a frigate really tells you what kind of weaponry the Alliance was operating. I mean, this ship was less than 600 meters long. That being said, despite its small size, it was relatively powerful and its power came mostly through its speed and its weaponry rather than its armor. What's also interesting about the MC-30 is that it relied heavily on proton torpedoes to do its damage. Most ships would rely heavily on turbo lasers, but the MC-30 kind of mixed the two. The frigate would also use cluster bombs to clear out other ships surrounding it, and that was pretty effective, especially when combined with its fast speed and its maneuverability, it could really get into the enemy position and break it up. Being that the MC-30 was only a small frigate, it obviously couldn't take that much damage to its hull. It had the standard strong Mon Calamari shields, which could recharge quite quickly. However, if those shields were depleted, the ship was in big, big trouble. Nonetheless, the Rebel Alliance often went small and fast, and for that reason, the MC-30 was the fifth most dangerous ship that they used. Number four is the Assault Frigate Mark II, and this ship actually has quite an interesting history. The Assault Frigate Mark I was based off the design for the Dreadnought class heavy cruiser, which I mentioned in most of my videos just because it was so popular among the galaxy. However, unlike the Dreadnought, the Assault Frigate Mark I was actually an Alliance only ship, which was kind of unique because typically the Alliance would steal ships from other you know, factions and it's not very often that the Empire is trying to copy a design that the Alliance used, but that was the case for the Assault Frigate Mark I. The Assault Frigate Mark II was a further iteration on this line of ships and it was much beefier than the MC-30. The ship was almost 700 meters long and, like any good rebel ship, used Mon Calamari designed shields to help support it in battle. The original Assault Frigate had serious problems maintaining its shield and also powering its weapons. That was something that was improved on for the Mark II. And despite the fact that it really only has 45 gun emplacements, it could still get in there and do some real damage, especially when in numbers, as of course, rebel ships often were. Also interesting is that the ship was controlled heavily through computers, and that was obviously very helpful to the Rebel Alliance, who were often short on naval personnel. Anyway, the advanced shielding, the interesting use of automation, and the decent firepower make the Assault Frigate Mark II the fourth deadliest ship used by the Rebel Alliance. Number three is the Liberator Class Cruiser, another state-of-the-art ship used by the Alliance. And what's really important about this ship, at least to me, is that it operates not only as a battleship, but also as a carrier. If you've noticed so far, all of the ships have been too small to actually carry fighters with them. Well, the Liberator changes that and can carry 72 or probably more fighters at any given time with it. And again, that's a huge deal because without ships like this, you've got to bring your fighters into battle in dedicated carriers. And dedicated carriers are often pretty defenseless and they're big target for the opposing side. The ship wasn't big though. I've read various reports would say that it might be between 400 meters to a kilometer. I would put it probably around 600. But as I briefly alluded to as I introduced this ship, what really made it stand out was its technology. And the Liberator had especially advanced shielding, hull, and engine. So kind of the opposite of what you would expect to see in a normal carrier. We're also not exactly sure how strong its weaponry is. And a lot of that kind of comes from some misunderstanding caused by the Strongholds of Resistance RPG guide. But it probably had at least 100 combined turbo laser and ion cannon, so it certainly wasn't a slouch. Nonetheless, this extremely advanced, multi-purpose vessel was the third strongest ship used by the Rebel Alliance. So now we're finally getting above a kilometer, and the second most powerful ship used by the Rebel Alliance was the Dauntless Class Heavy Cruiser. And I say big, this ship wasn't huge, but it was 1.2 kilometers long, which compared to what we've seen so far, not half bad. However, besides the fact that it was obviously large and in charge, 
we don't really know a whole lot about the Dauntless, so I'm going to read its entry in the Star Wars Encyclopedia. One of the largest cruisers in the Rebel Alliance, it was built from the hull of a luxury liner. It carried excellent sensor and countermeasure equipment. Extra shielding and armament were added to make the Dauntless cruisers effective frontline ships. I find the fact that it's an effective frontline ship to be extremely interesting, and really, that alone kind of necessitates its place on this list because everything we've seen so far, and really just general rebel military strategy, is kind of geared towards hit and run situations. While those ships are fast and small, the Dauntless seems to be a more heavy, more slow ship which could really, you know, slug it out with perhaps even a Star Destroyer. So for that reason, the Dauntless class cruiser was the second most deadly ship used by the Rebel Alliance. Number one is, of course, the MC-80 class star cruiser. The MC-80 had various subtypes, from the Liberty to the Wingless, but we're going to look specifically at the Home 1 type because I think it best exemplifies what makes this ship great. The most important thing is that this ship could slug it out with the big boys. It was almost one and a half kilometer long and could take on a Star Destroyer in a head-to-head -head battle and perhaps come out on top. But why could it come out on top? What made this ship so good? Well, let me explain. The first is, of course, the standard Mon Calamari shielding which is always excellent. However, unlike, for example, the MC-30, the MC-80 Home 1 type had a very strong hull underneath that shield, and really the hull was comparable, if not stronger, than most Imperial Star Destroyers. The ship wasn't amazing offensively, and it really had lesser firepower than similar sized Imperial ships. However, what really makes the Home 1 great is its versatility, and people always make fun of me because it's my favorite word to use when talking about this ship, but it's just true. Because not only was the Home 1 pretty effective on the front lines, but it was also a very, very good carrier. And it could bring with it over 120 Rebel Starfighters, which could really defend it, go on the offensive if you got something like a B-Wing, just cause havoc on the battlefield. So its ability to carry ships into battle, combined with its strong shielding and hull, along with its, you know, not too bad offensive capabilities, make the MC-80 Home 1 type the most deadly ship used by the Rebel Alliance. So I really hope you guys enjoyed this list, and making it has kind of raised some fundamental questions about space battles in the Star Wars universe on my end. So really what I've been wondering is whether it's better to have your main capital ships carry your fighters into battle and your smaller ships can support it, whether it's better to have dedicated carriers or something in the middle. So I'm going to pose the following question and I want you guys to answer it down in the comments. You've just been hired as the chief engineer for the Rebel Alliance's Navy. Your task is to design the newest, state-of-the-art, most powerful capital ship that you can. So you have 100 points that you can allocate to one of four categories, and those categories are defense and shielding, offensive capabilities and firepower, speed and maneuverability, and fighter carrying and fighter support. So how do you allocate those 100 points? Would your ship be more of a carrier, kind of like the MC-80, or would it be more of a frontline assault ship, say like the Imperial Tector class? Also, how would you break down the MC-80? How would you distribute those points? I think the MC-80 probably has 35 in shielding and 35 in fighter support and carrying capacity, and then it would split the rest between its engines and its offensive capabilities. Anyways, guys, I hope you found not only this video, but that question interesting. Again, let me know down in the comments, and of course, thank you so much for watching, guys. May the force be with you.